McLaren Applied Technologies is arguably the next big thing at McLaren. We're very proud of our racing heritage in Formula One, celebrating 51 years in that sport. Um, equally proud of our achievements in the supercar business. But we're on a mission to deliver a, a high performance technology global company. And we're going to be a technology company that goes racing. Now, when I joined the team and became one of the founding members of McLaren Applied Technologies, we decided to set ourselves the mission to deliver breakthroughs in performance through the application of advanced technology and design. Far more than technology transfer from racing, we wanted to use our approach and our DNA to fast track prototypes to deliver performance, embracing emerging technologies from the outside world. And that's where I saw the opportunity to capitalize on the convergence of data management, predictive analytics, and simulation to deliver high performance design of products and processes. And that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, here. Being small at the outset five years ago, we decided we had to be very selective about who we work with. So we chose to only work with pioneers and visionaries who shared our singular ambition to win. And by that, in commercial terms, we mean being the best at whatever we do, being the first to do something, or going beyond what people thought were the limits of performance. Similarly, we decided that we would co-develop our solutions and our partners would take them to market. And that's how we've managed to scale very fast in a very short time and become recognized as one of the most innovative, profitable, fast-growing companies in the UK. The company is founded on the three core competencies that I show here that also represent the convergence that I see happening in industry. Our starting point is performance management systems, systems that measure what we want to manage, telemetry, if you will. But the measurement is not the value. The value is the insight that you extract from the, the measurement. And I like to say actionable intelligence is really what we're looking for. That intelligence is fed into models, models that learn. So the more data you feed, the better the output becomes. And so we get to predictive intelligence. And over more time, with more data, with machine learning, we get to prescriptive intelligence, such that the model suggests the winning moves. When you can do that in your world, you can truly change the game. We've been doing that for more than a decade in Formula One racing. So performance management feeds models. Models give insight. Insight plus simulation allows us to support our decision making. Um, as humans, we're, we need cognitive enhancements, so we use these sort of tools to make us make the best decisions more often. And at the higher level, we use simulation to design products and processes, but with a human in the loop, which is going to be my next theme. Uh, and our vision is actually that data will be embedded in all things that we design. So for building products, they will be intelligent products. At the very least, they'll be meta products, products that inform us on how we're using that product and tell us how to get more from it, or tell me how the public is using the product I've designed. So my next iteration will be better. And then further out, we expect adaptive intelligence to be pervasive, such that the products that we ship to market will actually sense who's using them, adapt to the context of use, and deliver higher performance. And this isn't science fiction. The next series of slides will talk about real case studies where we've implemented such a vision. Now, imagine designing a product in an entirely virtual world with the customer in the loop using full immersive simulation. That's how we design racing cars in a facility just like this. The beauty here is we put the customer, the test driver, in a Formula One chassis in a simulator that powers the chassis to move like it's the real thing. Now, the model is so good because it's based on a decade's worth of performance management on the car. The car is fully instrumented. We produce models. We've got predictive analytics going on in the background that makes this simulator replicate the real world. Then I bring the design team into this environment, and effectively, I've got a closed feedback loop between customer design team in an immersive simulation. It's a very, very fast way to innovate, to stay competitive in a sport. So I can change the design, get instant feedback from the customer, and move on knowing what the performance gain was. This is an innovation cycle that's extremely short. So I have idea, I simulate, I implement, I get feedback. You take that into the conventional world, you get a significant competitive advantage. I can shorten the time to market for the release of a passenger car. We already design our supercars in that same facility I just showed you. We bring the designers in, and the test drivers tell us how that car drives, even when I haven't even started machining the parts for that car. They can tell me what the car will be like in two to three years' time when it gets released. 
So I anticipate in the future, just as race cars are customized to an individual driver, why aren't passenger cars customized to the way I drive, to the roads I use? One size really shouldn't fit all. And we took that same philosophy actually into our next um, pioneer. This is Specialized Bicycles from uh, California. They came to us with a mission to design fast bikes. They made the assumption that a smooth ride was a fast ride. Maybe a light bike makes it go faster. But we challenged them. We didn't just rise to the challenge as it was posed. We said, if you don't know what's going to happen when you make a change, how do you know it's even worth making? So we said, rather than just designing a light bike or a smooth ride, we try and understand why that's a good thing. So we instrumented the bike. So that's our performance management system, if you will. We built up a model so that we could get some actionable intelligence. We started to understand the dynamics of a bike and how that was affected by the surface on which you ride and very significantly by the rider. Because in this case, the engine is the human, if you will, and each of us has a very specific physiology. So he's had to model the human, the bike, and the environment in an integrated fashion. Then we built up a simulator. We said, if it works for cars, surely it works for bikes. Let's put a human in the loop and simulate a product around a specific rider. So put the rider first, then design the, the product. And what we found was there's no such thing as the world's fastest bike. There's no such thing as the perfect bike design because it has to be personalized to the rider and to the road on which they uh, ride. So this approach of data-driven design using the data to feed the model, then the model to shape the design with the human in the center of the design equation, this has actually not only produced extremely fast bikes, um, still the fastest road bike in the world, the S-Works Venge, um, but it's also transformed the way Specialized go about designing bikes altogether. In their words, data-driven design and the use of a human in the loop simulator has delivered more insight in six months about bicycle design than they achieved in the previous 10 years. That's what I think is a, a great testament to how data and analytics used in the right way can transform business. Now, their own advert suggests this is a winning formula, and, and I would argue it is. Um, we've, we've applied it with success from racing cars to road cars to bikes. Actually, a whole slew of sports equipment we're now designing with intelligence built in. So I understand how you use that racket, how you use that club, and I can suggest to you, at a minimum, how to change the configuration to get more from that product. Uh, the vision long term is to basically build things like a bike with a brain. So instead of telling you how to configure the bike to make it go faster, how about the bike has adaptive suspension and changes to the terrain that you're actually riding on to make it go faster? This isn't a pipe dream. These are real engagements that we're working on. And I would argue that sport is a great place for me to start in with my team. But actually, the prize is to take that same philosophy into the medical space so that implants, prosthesis, start to become intelligent and adapt to the way my gait changes through life, the way my condition changes. Um, so we think there's a great frontier here to do intelligent product design. So, so much for product design powered by data. How about process design? And here I'm getting into the world of predictive analytics to really deliver cognitive enhancement to operators of complex processes. Uh, humans are very good uh, at working, but we, under stress, we're very poor at handling multiple variables. So one great example here is Heathrow Airport, uh, the second busiest airport in the world. We tried to understand the design challenge, understand the questions that our customer wanted to answer. And that was, how do I optimize an airport for on-time departure while also minimizing CO2 emissions over London? Um, simple sounding question, extremely hard to implement because just like most industry, um, civilian aircraft are managed in the model of measure what's going on and react as conditions change. The schedule is set in the morning and it's fixed for the day but the poor operators have to react on the fly as weather conditions change, for example. So we've measured what's going on live in the air. We use models to predict what will be happening up to two hours into the future. And then more importantly, we use that predictive intelligence to suggest interventions. Suggest interventions that are forward-looking. We say, if you make this intervention, 
the impact on your performance in indicators at the end of the shift or at the end of the day is X, Y, or Z. So we allow people to stop fretting and reacting to live data as it's coming in and allow them actually to, with less stress, anticipate what problems are coming around the corner, what scenarios may unfold into the future, and make a judgment call about which interventions to make in full knowledge of what the likely outcome will be. That to me sounds like common sense, but that doesn't make it common practice. Absolutely far from it in industry. So by implementing such techniques in Heathrow next year, we expect we'll be the first civilian airport in the world to implement such a solution. I find that staggering. Um, similarly, um, I came from oil and gas, so I kind of knew what the opportunity would be here. Um, I, I was working once at a conference and a, an individual heard me talk and he came up and said, listen, I think offshore drilling is a bit like the way you describe analytics in a race context. The driller is the driver, the rig crew is the garage crew, and the onshore team that's spe specialists and strategists is like our onshore team that drives strategy. Even in Abu Dhabi this weekend, the strategy will be delivered from the UK. So there you have essentially an integrated operation that needs to perform in real time. But what you may not know is in drilling, you've got sort of competing performance indicators. The driller is a contractor. The people who own the well extracting the oil have a real prize to look after. And they have a different set of KPIs. They want to optimize the safety, don't damage the geological formation, and then um, discover the oil in rapid time. The driller is paid on performance, so has a different set of motivations. So how do I optimize this? And the driller only has three variables to play with. Now these companies typically invest vast amounts in performance management systems that tell them what they were doing five minutes ago. I've never seen one that predicts where you will be if you carry on with this course of action. And this is what we've now implemented from concept to implementation in less than 18 months in the North Sea. We now have a real-time integrated operation where we can deliver optimum output in the surety that the model is learning all the time, it gets better the more we use it, but it tells the driller and it tells the manager of the well how to navigate to the optimum output, be that for productivity or economic return, saving tens of millions of pounds a year on one single well alone, given that it's a million dollars a day to do a drilling operation. Uh, data centers uh, may not sound such a sexy topic, but it's a real concern of ours, given that it consumes 2% of the world's electricity today. The consumption's rising exponentially and not sustainably. And most data centers run at about 50% efficiency, which is staggering. Um, we work with a pioneer um, from Phoenix, a company called IO, that wanted to design a data center with, with far higher efficiency. Our starting point was to design a performance management system to monitor how the cooling was affected of the servers in the large data centers that they run. It was interesting that the intelligence that we gathered allowed us to build up models that could pr eventually predict the capacity and demand in those data centers. That intelligence allowed us not only to understand how to manage the thermal management, you know, when to kick in the cooling in anticipation of a spike of usage, maybe when Goldman Sachs tr started trading, but we also figured that we could transform the business model. We could trade spur capacity in the future with a certain degree of confidence that that capacity would really be there. So not only did we get performance management, we produced tools and analytics that allowed them to simulate a data center that transformed their business model. Then they asked the question, well, is the data center that we have, like you see in the picture here, is that the optimum design? And surprise, surprise, it's not. Rectangles are not what are best suited for driving a cooling airflow. Um, if you know the dynamic response you need for cooling, you wouldn't be building square boxes, you would be building something that has curves, that's beautiful, it's cylindrical and spherical. And that's just what we've done. We've combined the three circles from that initial Venn diagram to optimize the design of data centers. And I should say, our typical efficiency is between 90 and 95% now. Uh, so final frontiers, I, I won't talk about it much here, but we are already doing biotelemetry with GSK for the first time in their history, monitoring people, extracting intelligence, and understanding how their condition is deteriorating or not. 
I actually think the future is not biotelemetry, the future will be bioenhancement. We've had a human high performance program running for almost a decade, and we believe that a combination of wearables and implantables can actually allow us to get much more from the bodies that we've got. So I, for one, am very optimistic about that future. And I just wanted to end here and say analytics to me is not a pet project at McLaren. Actually, it is the next big thing for us. And this morning, we announced the Strategic Alliance. We were one of the largest financial institutions in the world, KPMG. We've become their partner of choice to transform the way we do business through the application of data management, predictive analytics, and simulation. Thank you. Thank you.